This is the sunrise broadcast from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. The Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church is located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. I know that in most of the country right now, uh, sunrise has already come and gone, but for us here on the West Coast, it's about 20 minutes away, a little more than that. Um, Initially, I had hoped to be outside to do this broadcast this morning, but uh, I've uh, come down with a cold, and it's a little cold outside, and so it's probably best for me not to go out there with uh, other duties that I have today. But uh, I'm glad to be with you, even though we're inside, and hopefully we'll be able to see the sun rise together um, as it comes up uh, behind me here this morning. Um, we're uh, very thankful to be able to be up and about uh, early this Resurrection Day. Um, for most of my life, that's been my habit. When I was uh, uh, just a boy, a youngster, getting up and going down to the Cooper River and watching the sun rise from the air with my church family. When I was in Knoxville among the dogwoods and redbuds, waiting for the sun to come up over the Great Smoky Mountains and now here in Tacoma, waiting for it to rise over the Cascades in the east. Um, it's always a, a blessing to get up on this morning and consider uh, what the Word of God has to say. So let's take a moment for a word of prayer, and then we'll get started this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to gather uh, around your Word and to think about the wonderful events uh, that we commemorate on this day regarding the resurrection of our Redeemer from the dead. Lord, we know what he suffered for us. We know what he endured for us on the cross of Calvary. But we're so thankful that he came up from the dead on the third day, rose as he had promised, and Lord brought us with him. And now uh, we have such hopes and such joys because of what Christ has done. We pray that you'll bless this day and all of its activities. We pray that in our uh, activities with our families, our, all our celebration will be harmless and godly and bring honor to you. And Lord, we pray that in all our worship today, our hearts will be given over to you. We know that you seek to worship you, those who worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Lord, that that will be our heart this, this Lord's day. Again, we thank you for the time together. We ask you to bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm reading uh, from Matthew chapter 28 and verses 1 through 10. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings, or all hail. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now the passage we've just read is a familiar scene. It's, the, it's that way with things that uh, we acknowledge once a year, and each year they become more familiar to us. And for many of us, we've been marking the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, our Savior, for more than half a century. And that many memorials it can lead to a sort of comfortable familiarity 
that takes the edge off of things. It's not necessarily intentional, it just happens. This may play a part, perhaps, in the adorning of the occasion with all sorts of superficial things that uh, add uh, to the occasion. They add another dimension to the annual observation, and whether that's good or bad is a discussion for another time, really. We serve this time best, however, when we stick to the simple but sublime testimony of the scriptures. There you have the most profound reasons to celebrate and to rejoice every Sunday, every Resurrection Day. Jesus even commanded that the response to this event, his resurrection, and all its great implications for sinners saved by grace, that it be greeted with joy. So, for now, let's just consider briefly what's before us in the historical narrative. On Friday evening, we left Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting by the tomb. Matthew tells us in chapter 27 and verses 59 through 61 this. This is Matthew 27, 59. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Now, Sabbath day duties called those women away. But at the end of the Sabbath, we find them on their way back to the same spot. That's what we read in verse 1 of chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. It is uh, the break of dawn. And the women who followed Jesus in life now seek him in his tomb in death. We know from the other evangelists that they had an, that there was another party of women who were coming uh, to further prepare the body for burial. This was a rushed process immediately and after his death. Uh, the situation was shocking and it was chaotic at the time. And now they've had time to consider the matter, and they're bent on doing the job reverently and correctly. The fact that women who had heard Jesus talk about his resurrection after three days on more than one occasion were so oblivious to its possibility is an interesting aspect of the record. If it was all a deception, this is not what you would expect to find. Some commentators make the jump and suggest that the women hurried back to the tomb in expectation of the resurrection. But the very fact that they were coming to further prepare the body for interment makes them seem makes that seem incredible. And we might be tempted to be a bit impatient with these women and the disciples. They heard this so many times from Jesus. What were they expecting? And we would be impatient if it were not for the fact that our own resurrection, which is mentioned far more frequently, and with the evidence of Christ's own glorious rising behind it, is challenged from time to time in our own contemplation of the reality of the matter. Not that we're skeptical, but just a little unsure of what is going to happen, what it's going to look like, and exactly how it's going to take place, and even when it's going to happen. In the case of these early morning visitors, they have on their minds, we're told, something far more practical in earthly terms. They're worrying about how they're going to get in to tend to the dead body. 
who is going to roll away the stone for them. This, of course, was an issue that they did not need to concern themselves with at all, but at the time, they were greatly concerned about it. We read in verses 2 through 4 now of Matthew 28, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. God had appointed his angel to do the work for them that they were concerned about. It was, in, it was for their sakes, I should say, and for your sake that this was done. It was not so that Christ could get out of the tomb. It was so that they could get into it and see what had happened. Not so that they could attend to his broken and ruined body, but so that they and his other disciples could see plainly that he was not there and had indeed risen from the dead as he said and bear witness of the fact to you and to me. But notice as well just how easily the forces of earth are manipulated and made to serve the will of God. It's part of the testimony of the God that we worship, his power and his authority. The whole earth trembles before him. In the prophecy of Habakkuk chapter 3 and verses 6 and 10, we read this. He stood and measured the earth. That is, God stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the waters passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The trembling earth was a physical picture of the fulfillment of the work being completed on that morning, completed by the resurrection of the Son of God from death. In Haggai chapter 2 and verses 6 and 7, the prophecy of Haggai chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, we read, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. So the angel descends at will, unimpaired in any way. And we see how freely these creatures move at God's command. They go in and out of this world, serving God's and God's people and his purposes. Psalm 103, verse 20 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. So what you have here is the physical earth, all the things that are part of the physical earth, moving according to his will, moving according to his purposes. And then you have everything in heaven moving according to his will, moving according to his purposes. And you see that all taking place on this morning. The earthquakes, the angel comes uh, and removes uh, the, the stone and makes way for the women. Those creatures, those heavenly creatures, the angels, Hebrews tells us in chapter 1, verse 14, are all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to for those who will inherit salvation. So the angel rolls back the guarded and sealed rock. Pilate had told, you remember the Jews, to make it as secure as they could, and they did, and apparently that wasn't very secure at all, because everything they did could not keep Jesus in or his friends and disciples out of that tomb. Man imagines himself to be so powerful, and the evidence is to the contrary. His limitations are never more manifest than when it comes to trying to thwart God and his purposes. 
in this case, neither the powers of earth nor the rage and malice of hell could disturb any part of the purpose of God. Stones roll, guards faint, death lets go, enemies go down in defeat, oppressed saints are rejoicing, God prevails. Now we read, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. I can remember fine, fondly uh, being down by the Cooper River, our pastor up on the on the flatbed of a truck, a, a truck procured by my wife's father um, for the purpose, uh, the choir up there and the pastor up there and making us say over and over um, that he is not here for he is risen, as he said. As we think about this next section, the first thing I'd like for you to notice is that there are no more eyewitnesses to the actual resurrection than there were to his incarnation. And for the same reason, this beloved is a holy thing, so far beyond the ability of finite and fallen minds to observe and drink in that to expose them to it would be simply overwhelming. It is a mystery that belongs to the divine purposes and ways of the God who made all things out of nothing. Both his birth and his resurrection from the dead are carefully attested to. They're carefully foretold, but there are no witnesses to the events themselves as they take place, or no record of that. Now, there's a good deal of discussion over exactly how many hours Jesus' body remained in the tomb. How to calculate the three days. But I like Matthew Henry's emphasis here. He takes the position that no matter how you calculate it, Jesus rose as quickly as divine justice and righteousness would allow. That's the clock here, not uh, the hours of day or the counting of days. John tells us that he said to him and the others, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. It was three days that fulfilled the demands of divine justice. How many hours each day was is not the point. It's the fulfillment of justice. He would linger no longer in death than the work required. And as soon as it was clear that he was dead indeed, he vanquished death in the triumphant return to life. It's also impressive to think about just how prepared the angel was for these women and the others coming to the grave and how this ministering servant helps them out. For example, he knows that they will be afraid and uncertain and calls on them to be at peace. He, he had nothing to be afraid of, and that might have well have made him calloused to their timidness. But no, he's ready to urge them on in their own faith and in their own hopes, and he calls them to put aside their fears of him, their fear of the grave, their fear of the situation, and to look and to see what has happened. He knows why they've come, who they seek. He knows they're on a senseless errand. He reminds them of the things that they had heard from Jesus. It had seemed so mysterious, but as one says, it proved so simple. It seemed so incredible, 
and now it's the plain reality of the situation. He offers them the opportunity to view the empty tomb. He invites them to enter a place that usually is filled with dread and sorrow and eeriness, but which is now just an empty room. But that empty room replaces dread and, and happy expect with that happy expectation. It replaces sorrow with joy. The eeriness is replaced with friendliness. There is nothing to fear in this tomb because it is an empty tomb. And then he has instructions for them. You know, too much time is really spent, I think, speculating about angels and not enough time studying what is revealed by the word. So listen to what it says here as we move on. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Notice that when Jesus sees his beloved ones, he cries out, Hail! or more specifically, rejoice. They left the tomb, dancing, as it were, in their minds between fear and joy. A situation brought on by the uncertain nature of all that had transpired so far. But it is Jesus himself who settles the issue for them. He commands them to set aside all fear and to be filled with joy. Let it all go away and instead rejoice. In Isaiah 44, verses 21 through 23, we read, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains. O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. The reasons for joy are manifold, but two stand out. By his resurrection, Jesus has taken away all fear of the grave for the believer. And by his ascension to the throne, he took away all fear of heaven's judgment as well. You who believe today have nothing to fear in heaven or in earth. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19, Paul says, For it pleased the Father that in him that is in Christ all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now it would be wrong to underestimate the liveliness of the scene and the joy that is an undeniable part of this moment. A jubilant, victorious, risen Savior speaks to them with joy and expectation. You can just imagine what it was like for Jesus to present himself to his first group of disciples here, these women, with the news that he had risen from the dead, as he said, and with all the peace and joy that comes from the gospel, now is the risen Savior, not bringing the message as the man of sorrows, but bringing the message now as the triumphant one over sin and death for them all. Also, it can be easily missed, even dismissed, I think, in the excitement of the moment. But Jesus says something here that he has never said before because now it is true 
in a way it was never true before. For the first time, at this moment, when he meets Marys, the Marys, Jesus Christ refers to his disciples as his brethren, his brethren, his brothers. It's such a simple thing, but one filled with such significance. Rather than his death separating him from them, it is the means by which they and you, beloved, are brought near to him. Because of his blood so freely shed on our behalf and the washing away of our sins, because of our adoption by grace, we may now be counted his brethren. You can imagine what this new designation would have meant to the disciples who had betrayed him and fled away at his arrest. And as brethren, we are confirmed in our part in his resurrection. Hebrews says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons, and we would say daughters, to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I. And this is Christ speaking. And he says, here am I and the children whom God has given me. It's the picture of him standing before the throne of his father and saying, here am I, and here are the children, including you and me, that the father has given me. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 9 through 15. What a wonderful story, and what a blessed way to begin the day. I think you can see the sun is uh, not quite over the Cascades, but it's pretty close right now. It's almost uh, gotten up. Uh, Bonnie's pointing to it there. Is it over the edge yet? I yeah. assume they're over here. So you can just see... Uh, the very top of it, uh, the sun coming up over the mountains outside there. Well, um, thank you for being with us this morning or even watching this at some later time. We'll be gathering at the church at 9 o'clock for a light breakfast this morning. And then uh, we'll be having our Sunday school class, which will be on YouTube at uh, 9.30. And then at 10.30 a.m., we'll be having a service our regular worship service, which we'll be having some music from some of our church members and uh, some singing together and, of course, uh, uh, messages from the Word of God. Four messages, four messages this Sunday, short ones, but uh, if you can't be with us in person, we invite you to come down and be with us. But if you can't be with us in person, join us online on YouTube. That will be. So remember, this is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church, 6202 South Tyler Street, Tacoma, Washington. We're going to pray, and uh, I hope you have a very blessed and wonderful Resurrection Day. Let's talk to the Lord. Father in heaven, how we thank you for uh, the events marked by this day, commemorated by us on this day. Lord, what a wonderful thing to know that Christ came and offered himself on the cross of Calvary 
that through his shed blood we might have the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, what a wonderful and blessed thing that uh, he rose from the dead according to the word on the third day and that we get to know that and believe that and rejoice in it. And Father, just as those women heard that beautiful and wonderful greeting on that day from the risen Savior, so have all of we who believe. We've heard our own all hail. And Lord, how thankful we are for it. Thank you, Father, for showing us such grace and mercy. And Lord, if there's anyone who's watching this and wondering what in the world we're doing or what this is about, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts even now through your word and let them see that there's nothing like this that has ever happened in the history of the world. This has nothing to do with rabbits and the coming of spring. It has to do with the saving of lost souls from sin and death and bringing them into life, the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. May that message speak to their hearts this day. And may all of us who believe rejoice together in this wonderful message that he was not there because he was risen as he said. Receive our thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.